Open up to a couple of places. Romans chapter 10, if you'll find that. Romans 10. And then, once again, to Mark chapter 11. We've been sitting on this little passage, teaching of Jesus in Mark 11. And we'll start there again today, reading that passage once again. But hold your place in Romans chapter 11. While you're turning, let me just say to our online audience, anybody watching live stream, listening to podcasts, watching via YouTube, Roku TV, Apple TV, Fire TV, any, any way you're watching or listening today, you may not be here in this anointed atmosphere in the sanctuary where I'm standing. But let me tell you, God has a word for you today. He knows who you are. He knows what's happening in your life right now. And so if you'll open your heart to receive from him, he will speak directly to you in a very real time and profound way. God loves you, and he's ready to move mountains on your behalf. So listen up today, because the Lord is with you. All right, Mark chapter 11 is where I want to turn, and I believe this is going to be the conclusion to this short series. I've been teaching these series monthly, so emphasizing something every month. So I plan to go into something else next month. But I want to conclude this, and I believe the Holy Spirit has led me to, to conclude it in a special way here that will help us to actually put this into practice. It's not enough just to know about moving mountains. We need to be able to do it. We need to do it. And so the Lord's going to show us what we need to do to begin to see these mountains moving and our faith activated. And so let's all read this once again together. Mark chapter 11. We're going to read the 22nd through the 24th verses, those three verses. We're not once again going to read the context where what happened was the day before Jesus had with his disciples walked by and he went up to a fig tree to see if there was fruit on the fig tree. He didn't find fruit. And he made this statement. He said to the tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And then they walked on. They went back to where they were staying. The next morning headed to Jerusalem. They were walking by the same tree with the disciples. He was. And Peter said, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed has already withered away from the roots. And Jesus responded to Peter, and that's what we're going to read here. We're going to read Jesus' response to Peter. Peter said, Master, look. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Peter said, Master, look. And Jesus said, have faith in God. What does that mean? We don't have to look. I said it. That means it's going to happen. Amen? I don't have to look. I don't need a doctor's report to tell me that what I said is coming to pass. We don't put our faith in doctor's reports. Sometimes I have people say, Pastor, pray, pray. The, uh, the doctor's report is coming. Pray that the doctor's report. I'm praying for you to be healed. And the doctor's report will verify that eventually. But my faith is not in the doctor's report. Amen. The doctor's report doesn't need to be healed. Amen. Let the doctor's report be the doctor's report. We believe the word of God. Thank God. And eventually the doctor's report will, will line up to that when the manifestation takes place. You understand what I'm saying? We have to be careful that we don't start pushing our faith to get the doctor's report healed. No, no. You understand what I'm saying? Master, look. The fig tree is withered away. Look, the report came back. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Just because the report came back good, that doesn't mean God's faithful. God is faithful because God is faithful. Whether we see it or whether we don't, God is faithful. How many of you can see the lesson here? Master, look, the fig tree withered away. The fig tree which you curse is withered away. He said, have faith in God, not in what you see. Hey, Amen. That's a good lesson right there. My point is, we're not reading that part. <laughs> but we're going to pick it up with what Jesus taught. Amen. All right, here we go. Ready? Three verses, Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, from the New King James Version. If you don't have it in your lap or in your hands, follow along on the screens. Ready, go. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, 
and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, if you've been here the last few weeks or if you've been listening or watching, then you would know that Jesus has been very precisely and in a step-by-step -step detailed way walking us through this whole principle about how we can move mountains, we can change circumstances in our lives by faith in God and by using our mouths to say and to pray. Verse 23 talks about saying to the mountain, to a situation. Verse 24 talks about praying to God. But both are using our words and both are using faith. And so uh, I don't want to take time to do review today because there's something I really need to get to today that's going to unlock this to a new, new level. But I encourage you, this would be a series to go over and over and over because the, these are the fundamentals of faith and believing God. These are fundamentals. This, is a, th this should be a classic that we always refer back to periodically so that we understand how these things work and we make sure our fundamentals are in place to believe God. But go back and listen to these first three teachings and you'll see how important what Jesus is teaching us is. Now, here's what we want to hit today. Have faith in God. Look at the 23rd verse. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Now watch this. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes. And does not doubt in his heart. This is where we struggle the most. See, you can speak as if you're speaking with authority and as if you're speaking with faith. But that doesn't mean you are. I remember when our kids were little, we had these two Yorkshire Terriers. And uh, for our daughter, we got... Uh, one that we named Minnie, and for our son, we got one that we named Mickey. And uh, Minnie and Mickey. Well, Minnie, let me just tell you right now, she was not saved. <laughs> she, was, she was rebellious. She walked in the flesh. She, she, she struggled with her flesh, and so she was not the most obedient dog we ever had. And she'd get out, and she was so feisty. If she saw another dog, I mean, she wanted to chase it down, and she'd run up to the biggest dog and just cuss it out. I mean, I'm telling you, she had, you could just tell, she had the foulest mouth. I mean, she would say things to these dogs. And you could just tell, man, uh, she needs to get born again, right? But she'd get out, and, and we'd call her, Minnie, Minnie, you know, because she'd run right across the street, a major street. And uh, we'd call her and such, well, she didn't want to listen. But usually, not always, usually she'd listen to me. And I'd say, many, I mean, I'd just give it. And then she'd, she'd know, oh, man, the big dog is calling, right? And so she'd often turn around when I'd call her. Well, when I wasn't home, Kimberly would tell me that Jonathan would get out there, you know, and she'd get out, and Jonathan would get out there with his little squeaky voice, you know, five or six years old. Many, 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 come, many, you know. And, of course, she didn't pay any attention to him. And then Kimberly would say, and then he tried to act like dad. And he'd say, Mary, Mary, Mary. But how many of you know, that dog knew that's not dad. <laughs> that's just squeaky little Jonathan trying to act like dad. Isn't that right? And you know, a lot of Christians do this in prayer. Yeah. Oh yeah, their mountain needs to be removed. And we say to that mountain, mountain, I command you to be removed. You know, it doesn't matter how loud you are. It doesn't matter how forceful you are. It doesn't matter what look on your face you have. It doesn't matter how you jiggle, <laughs> dance. How many of you know all of that demonstrative stuff does nothing? It does nothing to the mountain. The mountain is not impressed with your volume. The mountain is not impacted by your shaking. None. Zero. That's all natural stuff. What matters is do you believe without doubting what you're saying? See, Jesus is getting down to it and saying, let me tell you what really makes the difference. 
if you have faith and do not doubt in your heart, but believe that those things you say will be done, that mountain will move. Amen? See, we have to understand what really makes the impact. It's not the volume. It's not the emotion or the passion. It's the faith in what we're saying. Amen? Let, let me show you what Matthew says. Matthew is quoting Jesus in this same passage. And here's the way Matthew's gospel relates this. In Matthew 21, 21, it says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. Notice, if you have faith and do not doubt, watch this. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree. What did you just say? What I just did to this fig tree, you'll do, you'll do this kind of thing. You'll not only do what was done to the fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, it will obey you. Isn't that right? So what did Jesus just say? This fig tree didn't wither up overnight because I'm the only begotten son of God. You will, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, it will obey you. Is that right? You'll not only do. What did Jesus just say? This fig tree didn't wither up overnight because I'm the only begotten son of God and I have a special power. This fig tree withered up overnight because I believed in my heart with no doubt that what I said was going to happen. That's why it withered up. And if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, it will obey you. Is that right? Listen, you have mountains in your life right now, and Jesus is talking to you and saying, why are you letting that stay there? Why are you allowing that to stay there? Why are you allowing that to stay there? If you have faith and do not doubt, you'll not only do what was done to this victory, but you'll say to your mountains, be removed and be cast in the sea, and they will obey you. Jesus is speaking to us today. Why are you allowing that to stay there? Why are you allowing that mountain to stay there? Well, I've been looking at my checkbook. I've been looking at the doctor's report. Have faith in God. Because if you believe without doubting and you say it, this is, this is, don't get mad at me. Some people get mad at the preacher saying, he said, I didn't say this. I'm reading what Jesus said. Some, come on, say amen. amen. Don't you let anybody fool you with this. All I'm doing is slowly walking through what Jesus said. And once you see it, it builds your confidence. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to let us know, this is not just me, guys. Do this. This is the way it works. But here, this big key, if you have faith and do not doubt. If you have faith and do not doubt. So the big question is this. How do you get that kind of faith? Oh, we all have faith. But how do you get that kind of faith? The kind of faith where you're convinced that that mountain is moved even when it's standing there still. And yet in your heart, you are convinced. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. It, it's moved. In my heart, it's already moved. And I'm not even concerned about it. I'm not worried about it. I'm not up at night. Oh, Lord, I thank you that it's moving. Oh, Lord. No, 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 I'm not doing that. Why? Because I'm confident in my heart. Amen. Faith rests. If you're not at rest, you're not yet in full faith. You're worried. You're still doubting. When the doubt's gone, the fear's gone. Amen. The concern is gone. Anxiety's gone. Because you believe. Amen. Somebody said, but what if, you're, what if you're deceived? Yeah, but even a deceived person can be relieved. Is that right? Ah, why? I thought I, maybe they read the doctor's report wrong. Ah, oh, that's great. They read it wrong. Right? The point is that when you really believe God, you believe that that is what's happening, then you're relieved. You're not under stress. You're not in fear and anxiety. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. He, 
He said, you need to get to this place where you really believe in God. You believe in the promises of God. You believe in the faithfulness of God. You believe in the power of God. And you believe that what he said about you praying and saying things in faith are true. And therefore, you're relieved. You're not worried. Yeah, you got to take care of business day to day and such, but you're not under pressure because you believe. Amen. So the question is, How do I get that kind of faith? Because we all have some faith. We have faith enough to say or pray. But how do you get to where you don't doubt in your heart? And that leads us to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Now notice this. In Romans chapter 10, we're going to read the 17th verse, but we could go all the way back to the 13th verse, where the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then the 14th verse, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring clad tidings of the kingdom, and so on. And then uh, verse 16, but they have not all obeyed our report. And then verse 17, so then, this is what we're getting to, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now watch this. So then, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Let's go back to the 16th verse. Put the 16th verse up on the screens. Watch this. In verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? What does that mean? We've preached the gospel. We've given them the report of the Lord, but they didn't all obey it. They didn't all believe it. Amen. Amen. So he just said, we preach the gospel. Even Isaiah reported and said, Lord, I preach your word. I gave them the word that you gave me, but they didn't believe it. Who has believed our report? They didn't believe it. And then the next verse says, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, wait a minute. Didn't they hear the word of God? And Isaiah said, but they didn't believe it. Amen. Isaiah said, I gave them the word. They didn't believe it. Paul said, we gave them the gospel, and they didn't, they didn't receive it. Amen. And then the next verse says, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That shows us definitively that the Bible does not say, so then faith comes by hearing the word of God. Because the verse right before it said they didn't believe it when they heard it. Amen. I said amen. Amen. So verse 17 does not say, so then faith comes by hearing the word of God. Verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. See, in in fact, in the English language, you know, often, and this is true with other languages as well, but in the English language, there are certain sentence structures that have missing, or we could say understood words, like if we're giving a command. I could look at somebody and say, go to the store and get some milk. But the understood subject of the sentence is missing. You understand what the subject is. The subject is, you go to the store and get some milk. But we don't have to say, you go to the store, because I'm looking at you. You know I'm talking to you. I can just say, go to the store. But see, I didn't say you, but it's understood. In the same way, sentence flows and structures have these missing words that are understood, and often we need to insert that understood word to make sure that we understand what it's saying. And there's one in this passage. Here's how it goes. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. Isn't that the way this is set up? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hearing what by the word of God? Hearing comes by the word of God. So this verse is telling us how two distinct things come. The first part tells us how faith comes, and the second part tells us how hearing comes. You understand? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. So let's go back to the first part. So then faith comes by hearing Hearing what? Somebody said, well, the word of God. Well, then why didn't he just say faith comes by hearing the word of God? Because that's not what it means. Because the verse right before it said, they heard the word and they didn't believe it. 
Because here's what he's saying. Essentially, faith does not just come by hearing the word. Because so many people will sit in church and they don't believe it. They'll over and over, they'll listen to sermons. They'll read their Bibles maybe every day and the mountains just sit. The enemies just attack and continue to devour. And yet they're reading their Bibles. And yet they're listening to messages. And yet they don't have the faith. Because faith does not just come by listening and hearing God's word. Faith comes by, essentially, faith comes by hearing God. And hearing God comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing God. Or we could say it like this. Faith comes by hearing the voice of God. You need to know that God is speaking to you. Not just that it's in the Bible. Oh, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Well, that's great to say that. There's nothing wrong with that. But is the Bible speaking to you? Why do we hold up our Bibles and say, this is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. Because I don't need to just know that it's in the Bible. I need to know if God is saying this to me. When he says, by his stripes, we are healed, does that include me in this situation with this sickness? See, I need to know in my heart. Now somebody said, well, it does apply to you. I know that, but until you hear it from God, until you get that assurance from God, you will not have the faith. Faith comes by hearing God, hearing that confirmation from God, hearing the voice of God. And hearing the voice of God comes by hearing the word of God. This is why we need to go and preach the gospel and the word of God all over the world. Because hearing from God comes by hearing the word of God. Amen. How many of you can see that? Boy, this thing, I could not share this and teach this some years ago with such clarity, but I see it so clearly today. And this is what Jesus taught. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, there's a distinction in the hearings. And we know this to be true. Anybody's been through level three and we study the sower sows the word. Jesus said in Mark 4, 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Isn't that right? If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then in Matthew 13, the same parable, the same passage, but in Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 13, Jesus said, therefore I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. How many of you understand? Let's, let's put this like this. Hearing the word of God, they are not hearing God. Hearing the word of God, they're not hearing what God is saying to them. They're hearing the Bible, they're hearing the message, but they're not hearing God speak to them. Why is that? Well, he tells us in the passage. Hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So he's talking to people now that can hear. What is he saying? You're hearing with your ears, but you're not hearing with your heart. And that's true in church. We could be sitting here in church, and man, God is speaking through his word. And one person said, oh, God's speaking to my situation right now. And the person next to him saying, that was a good point, wasn't it? I thought, I, I, I thought that was a good point. But they're not hearing what God is saying to them. See, faith does not just come by hearing the word. Knowledge can come just by hearing the word. But faith comes when you know that God is saying it to you and applying it to that situation. And now you can stand up and look at that mountain with faith and say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be removed. And you believe in your heart because you know you have God's backing in this situation with that mountain. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 10, 27? He said, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. They don't just hear the Bible. They don't just hear the word. No, they hear me. They hear me. When the word of God is being preached, they hear me. Let me tell you, you can develop a hearing heart. You can develop a hearing heart. Let me just tell you this. 
I can't hardly start reading the Bible. I go to do my daily reading, and I try to do it every single time. I'm sure I miss it on occasion, but I'm telling you, every single time I open up my Bible to do my daily reading, I say to the Lord, Lord, I want to learn your word. I need to hear and understand the Bible. However, Lord, I need to know what you're saying to me today. Lord, I need to discern your voice. I need to hear your instruction, your direction. What are you saying to me? I've got so many areas of my life that need work. Lord, speak, speak, Lord. And I mean, often I get into one verse and the Lord begins to speak. I have to break out my journal and start capturing what the Lord is saying. Not just, oh, look at that, Hezekiah. Wow, okay, so he sent the troops over there, okay. Boy, let me look over over here and see, you know, where else, you know, the troops were sent and how that correlates. Well, that's study and that's knowledge and all that. But what I'm saying is, God is trying to say things. God is speaking to us, but we don't have hearing hearts. And this is why we don't have faith. Even though we're hearing the word of God, we're not hearing God. Faith does not just come by hearing the word of God. Faith comes essentially by hearing God while we're hearing the word of God. Amen. How many of you can see this? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. My sheep, he said, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They follow me. How do they follow him? Because they're hearing his voice. You come into a church service, and while the message is being taught, you're hearing and discerning what God is saying to you, and all of a sudden, you know what to do. You know what to do with your marriage. You know how to relate to your spouse. You know what to do on your job. You realize, oh man, I have not been working like I should be working. I've said some things I should not have said. You're hearing God give you specific direction to line things up, to adjust things, to apologize, to change, make this decision, that decision, this change, that change, because you're hearing from God. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. How? Because they're not just hearing the word of God. They're hearing me. I am their shepherd, and I'm directing them specifically, precisely, in real time. And let me tell you, when you hear the voice of God, you have confidence that what you're doing is the right thing. Because faith comes by hearing him, and hearing him comes by hearing his word. Somebody say amen to this. Are you, are you catching this? See, this is, this is, Jesus is leading us now so precisely to say this is how it works. Not just by hearing random Bible in the background. Yeah, that's an opportunity to hear God. But that doesn't mean you're hearing him just because the Bible is going, just because you're reading, just because you're hearing a message. That does not mean you're hearing God, but oh, that's an opportunity to do so. And we should have our hearts open. Listen to what Jesus said in John 16, 12. He said to his disciples, this is the night before he died. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. What did Jesus just say? Jesus just said, now I'm giving you a lot of word, a lot of word. But when the Holy Spirit comes, oh, he's going to guide you into all the truth. Because you need to know which promises are applying to which situations right now, and what to say, and what to pray. And the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. And so, yes, you're going to have this book inspired, the truth inspired by the Holy Spirit. But on top of that, he personally is going to be right there with you while you're reading the word, while you're listening to the message. He's going to be right there with you, speaking to you, guiding you and saying, do this. Now do this. Now do this. So you can overcome your enemies. And so you can walk in the victory and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you see that? So Jesus told us, on top of the truth, you need the Holy Spirit now to come. And he said, and the Holy Spirit will not speak from his own authority, but whatever he hears from God, well, he hears clearly because he is God too. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whatever he hears from God, that from the throne, well, we could say from Jesus 
on the throne, the head of the church, whatever the head of the church is saying to us, the Holy Spirit's saying, here's the direction. So I'm guiding you into the truth, and, and in the midst of guiding you into the truth, I'm giving you precise, real-time instruction. And then when you hear God give you the instruction, you have faith, and you believe, and now you can act. Do you remember Peter? Peter's on the boat, and Jesus is walking out there, and all the disciples are freaked out. Ah, it's a ghost. And Peter, and, and Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's me. Remember that? It's I, right? And Peter said, if it's you, tell me to come out. See, I just need to hear you tell me. Yes, yes, it'd be great if you said, oh, you're going to do these signs and everything. You guys are going to do them. Lord, if that's you, tell me to come. I just need to hear your voice tell me, and if you tell me, I'm getting out of this boat. And many of you are stuck in a boat, and the moment you hear from Jesus, and you know that it's not just a biblical principle, that it's not just general to the body of Christ, but you know that he's speaking to you, it's time to step out of the boat. Then you will step out of that boat because you have faith that you can walk on whatever water is there that doesn't look like it can sustain you, but it will. It will because you know it will because you've heard his voice. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. This is so important. Listen to Galatians chapter three. Paul said this in the first verse. He said, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you is crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Now watch, watch this question. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? In other words, did you receive the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit, by being good enough, by obeying the law of the Old Testament? Or did you receive it because... When you heard the gospel, unlike other people who rejected it, you heard that God was bringing his salvation to you and that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was for you. And by hearing, you brought, it brought faith to your heart and you opened up by faith and received the Holy Spirit. He said, did you receive because you felt like being good enough, you qualified? Or did you receive because when you heard the word of God, it brought faith? And we know the answer. It's the hearing of faith. Now watch this. That's how they received. Verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? Of course, this passage is, is really keying in on where their confidence is. But it's also explaining the hearing of faith. That's why I'm bringing it out. Verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now watch verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you. See, first we were talking about you receiving the Spirit by the hearing of faith. Watch this. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, notice this. In the New King James and certain other ones, the word he, the, in fact, twice in there, therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or the, by the hearing of faith? Both are capitalized in this version. And, and I like the versions, and, and I don't think it's mandatory, but I like the versions that capitalize the pronouns for God so that, you know, we have a good idea when it says he that is talking about God. Uh, however... These are added elements of the translators. In other words, this is not in the original text that that's capitalized. That's added by the translators. So in other words, the translators are doing their best to, dis to discern which pronouns are referring to God and then to capitalize them to help us to understand that the passage a little better. In this passage, I'm confident that they missed it. And I I'm confident I know why they missed it. Because I don't believe this is saying that God is the one supplying the Spirit. Well, of course God supplies the Holy Spirit. And of course God works miracles. We do know that. But this passage is not talking about the ultimate source of the Holy Spirit or the ultimate source of the miracles and the power of the miracles. 
This is talking about the people that came to the Galatians to preach the gospel. These people that came and were the ones providing the gospel, the ones that were delivering the Holy Spirit to them, the ones that were performing the miracles among them. We're talking about human beings. And I'm confident about that. And here's, here's several reasons why. Number one, he says in verse five, therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? If that's God, let's ask this question, that being God. Therefore, God who supplies the Spirit to you and God who works miracles among you, did God do that among you by the works of the law? Or did God do that among you because he heard the preaching of the word and he believed it and that faith gave him the ability to do it? That's ridiculous. God doesn't need to hear the word of God to believe himself. Did you hear me? God does not need to have anybody preach to him the word of God to believe himself. He is God. And he's full of faith that he is God. This is not asking the question, did, 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 is God able to supply the spirit because he measures up by keeping the works of his law? Is that where God's confidence is? Or is God's confidence in, no, I heard the word and I believed it and that's how I'm able to supply the spirit and that's how I'm able to do miracles. Neither are true with God. Of course he believes it, but he didn't believe it because he heard somebody's sermon. He didn't believe it because he read a Bible. Amen? No, God is God, and he believes. He's the ultimate source of faith and the ultimate source of all things. And not only that, the next verse goes on to say, does he do it by the works of the law, or does he uh, uh, supply the Spirit and miracles by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Verse six, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So is this passage saying that just like Abraham believed God, God believed God? That's ridiculous. But why is it translated that way? Because by and large in the body of Christ, we cannot accept the biblical assertion that we human beings can have the authority in the name of Jesus and can freely receive something from the Lord and deliver that power. Do you remember Peter and John walk into the temple and the lame man was there and Peter and John said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have, we give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk and grab that guy and pull him up and the power of God hit that guy. They didn't pray. They didn't ask God to do anything. Silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we give you because Jesus told them freely you receive, freely give. We read all through the book of Acts where Peter and John and others would go to certain places like in Acts chapter 8 when Philip went down and the Bible says that, that Samaria turned to the Lord hearing and seeing the miracles which Philip did. Hearing and seeing the miracles which Philip did. The Bible is very clear, Philip did those miracles. Well, we know it's by the power of God, but he's the one that performed those miracles. And the, the whole city turned hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Amen. Well, how did he do it? He heard the word of God and had faith. And he's down there in faith to do that. Praise God. Can you see that? Okay, so I'm taking a long time on this, but I just want you to see that, that after they received the word of God, seeing the hearing and seeing the miracles that he did, then they were baptized in Jesus' name. They got saved, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. Then Peter and John were sent from Jerusalem, went to Samaria, and they shared with them about the Holy Spirit. And having laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And then there was that other guy, the sorcerer there. And, and he said, oh, let me pay you money so that I can have this power to lay hands on people and receive the Spirit. Do you remember that? He saw that when you laid your hands on them, they received. And Peter said, your money perished with you. Your heart's wrong. Remember that? Oh, you ought to pray that God will grant you repentance. You're so far off thinking money can buy this. Amen. Do you remember this? But notice, he thought, man, these guys got the power to deliver the Spirit. They lay their hands on people and they get, see, this is what this passage is talking about. Not talking about God. It's talking about human beings that come in the name of the Lord. And he's saying, listen, did you receive the Spirit by being good enough? 
Or did you receive the Spirit because you heard the Word and you believed God was speaking to you, and then you received the Spirit? And then he turns around and says, and it's not only you, what about the people that came to you to bring the Spirit and to work miracles? Did they do it because they were good enough, or did they do it because they had heard the Word of God, and they believed God was speaking to them and empowering them to do it? Well, that's exactly what this is saying. He's saying not only does the receiver, but the minister functions by hearing the word of God and through that hearing God say, I've anointed you to do this. I've called you to do this. Go lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Go minister the spirit to people. Why is that? Here's why. Because Psalm 29 verse 4 says, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord splits the mighty cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. Is God concerned about making toothpicks? Is that what this verse is about? Oh, let me show you how I make toothpicks. I just speak my voice and I splinter the cedar trees and make some really good tasting and smelling toothpicks, right? Is that what God's talking about? Why is he telling us how powerful his voice is? Is it because he wants us to know that he ha has the best lumber mill in the world? No, it's not about trees. He's saying, when you hear my voice, it will splinter your fear. It will shatter your doubts. And you will know that you know in your heart that you can do exactly what I told you to do. You can walk on water. You can move that mountain. You can curse that big tree. You can cause things to happen. But you must hear my voice. Not just hear the Bible, but you must hear what I'm saying. And when you hear... Faith comes, mountain moving faith, mountain moving faith. Somebody said, how do I get that heart to hear? Here's one way. Let me share it quickly. In Isaiah 30, 29, the Bible says, this is from the NLT, but the people of God will sing a song of joy like the songs at the holy festivals. What will they sing? A song of joy. We are so clouded by so much news, so much talk radio, so much Facebook, Instagram, constant information, constant information. Our hearts can't hear anything. Our hearts can't hear anything. The enemy has a whole system here that just keep us so packed in our minds. And any little break we have, let's pull out our phone. Let's get something in there. Let's fill up every gap so that we can't hear anything. We're so dull. And the Lord says, let me tell you one way to do this. He said, the people of God will sing a song. We just stop and we begin to sing a song of joy. Our God is so good. Oh, Lord, you're so good. It doesn't have to be any certain song. Oh, Lord, you're so good. Oh, Lord, you're my source. Oh, Lord, you're my healer. Oh, God, you're my provider. Oh, Lord, you're on my side. Promotion comes from you, my God. And you begin to sing a song of joy about how good your God is about how wonderful, about how protected you are, about how supported you are, about how you cannot fail because God is on your side. If God is for me, who can be against me? And let me, tell, let me show you what happened. But the people of God will sing a song of joy like the songs at the holy festivals. You'll be filled with joy as when a flutist leads a group of pilgrims to Jerusalem, the mountain of the Lord, the rock of Israel. And what will happen, verse 30? And the Lord will make his majestic voice heard. And the Lord will make his majestic voice heard. God said, if you'll just set things aside and turn to me and begin to sing to me, begin to focus on me, I will make my majestic voice heard. It will splinter your fears and doubts it will bring such faith to your heart that you begin to move those mountains with your words. Your prayers begin to be answered because now you're hearing the voice of God. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Let me just give you a quick few examples. I've rehearsed the story so many times, but sometimes there's a little point that's not emphasized. But in January of 99, Kimberly and I were at a minister's conference. And the Lord spoke to me. I want you to plan a church this year. All this, all the, what we've planted now, 32 congregations, including rock campuses and others, that have come from this one word, this one word from God. I want you to start a church this year, this one word. But what's often overlooked is we're at a minister's conference. 
And in this minister's conference, it's teaching after teaching after teaching after teaching. We're putting ourselves in a place for the Word of God to flow over us and to flow over us. And in the midst of the Word of God coming, I heard God. And God said, I want you to plant a church this year. From that point, I've never had a doubt that this church was from God, that God would move in this church, that God would expand this church, that this church would grow and flourish because God said so. Faith did not come just by hearing messages. Faith come when, came when I heard God speak to me. And then I knew it's time to step out of the boat. And from that day forward, we have been 100% committed because we heard God, because faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the Word of God. So we need to put ourselves under the Word of God so we can discern His voice and know what to do. And when we hear what to do, now we have the faith to move mountains, to step out of the boat and to get it done. To get it done. Let me share one more. There are two more that, that really would help. I remember when we were down in that one building and starting and then we began to grow and we began to pray that the buildings next to us, that the Lord would uh, cause those businesses to leave so that we could begin to assume those businesses. And they began to do it. The Lord began to do it. We didn't threaten anybody. No, <laughs> the Lord just began to do it. But I remember we were renovating now and the Lord was bringing in the people. The Lord was bringing in resources to be able to renovate because we didn't have a mother church. We didn't have the rock that's planting little baby rock in Anaheim. We had no mother. There's nobody to give us money. There's nobody to give us people. It's all God. We just go to the source. There it is. God is our source. We have nobody, no loans, no sponsors. I sent no letters to anybody. God said, do it. We do it and he'll pay for it. And so we stepped out and the Lord was doing it and we were growing. And the Lord was bringing in the funding, so we were renovating and such. But as time went on, I remember between the buildings, we had uh, assumed the lease on the building next door to the West Auditorium to the east, and then Treasure Island, which had three businesses. Three businesses had to move for us to take that building over. But between those three buildings were these two big industrial strength cinder block walls. I mean, filled with concrete and rebar and everything. It's not something that you just send two guys out with a sledgehammer and a wheelbarrow. <laughs> I mean, this is heavy duty stuff. You need heavy duty machinery to remove these walls and such. We got the permission to do it, but we didn't have the funds to do it. All of our funds were going toward the interior renovations. And so I kept asking our finance uh, pastor, Rig Guerra, I said, hey, do we have the money to get those walls out? Because we were running into com complications because if you pulled into one parking lot and it was full, now you got to go back out to Orangethorpe. And God forbid you have to make a left turn and wait for the traffic and make a left turn and go right back in the next driveway to find a parking space. And then that's full. Then you got to go back out. It was a mess. And we knew we got to get these walls out to have the free-flowing parking that we do today. And so I kept asking him, do we have the money to get those walls out? Well, we, we don't because we're working. We put everything that came in you know, toward this project and that project. And so this went on for, oh, five or six weeks. And I kept asking, him, hey, do we have the money? He said, well, we got, we got some uh, funds this past weekend to go toward this, but, but we had to put it toward this other, you know, because all these projects are happening simultaneously. And I remember one morning early, I pulled in about 6.30 in my, in my white Yukon. Never forget as long as I live. I pulled it into the parking lot and, and parked behind Treasure Island. And I'm sitting there, and I, I didn't want to shut, I shut the engine off, but I didn't want to shut the whole car off because I was listening to one of the two spies. You know what I'm talking about? Not all preachers are alike. Oh, there are a whole lot of preachers that all sound good, and they'll say, oh man, yeah, the word of God's good, God's faithful and all that. But when you get down to specific promises, they say, but you don't know for sure that God will actually do that because, you know, there are giants in the land and, you know, God's a sovereign God and God might break his own word, you know, because you just, you just don't know for sure. You just got to wait and see, wait and see if God really wants to do that for you. That's how the whole first generation out of Egypt died in the wilderness because they believed 
that God would break his own promise and that God would not follow through because 10 preachers came back and said, oh yeah, it's good land, Bible's good, promises are good and all that kind of thing, but you don't know for sure that God is going to give it to us so we may die right here or in there. Is that right? So I don't listen to them. I want to listen to people that believe that God is faithful to his promise. Not just faithful in general, but faithful to what he said. Because that's what God says he is. Faithful to what he said. And I was listening to one of the two spies. And I mean, my faith was being stirred. This man was preaching a, a storm. And it was bringing faith to my heart and confidence. I always want to put myself under the word of God. But in the middle of that, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there with the engine off, listening to this message about 6.30 in the morning, and all of a sudden, God spoke to me. And he said, stop waiting on money and use your faith and blow these walls down and get these buildings renovated. Now listen, that was not just direction. That was a correction. That was not just direction. That was correction. Oh, my heart was so full of faith, but my heart also sunk. Because, see, when we came, we didn't have money. There's no money. No. But we used our faith, and we said, in the name of Jesus, God told us to do this. It will happen. And we believed. But now that God is bringing in the resource, and now that the money's coming in, I didn't realize. I turned, and now I'm waiting until I see something before I use my faith. And the Lord was telling me, that's not what I taught you. I didn't teach you to wait on money. Money is not your God. Money is not your source. Stop waiting on money and use your faith and blow these walls down and get these buildings renovated. See, that's like the disciples with the five loaves and the two fish. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And they said, Lord, it'll take 200 denarii. Lord, that's going to take a lot of money. And in essence, Jesus said, it's not going to take any money. Bring me what you have and watch the power of God go into operation. Amen. Money is not our God. We don't wait on money. We do the will of the Lord and we use our faith to see things happen. Boy, I knew God had spoken to me. Stop waiting on money and use your faith and blow these walls down and get these buildings renovated. I've given you an assignment and I've given you faith. Go. Boy, I got out of the car. Man, I walked up to one of those walls. I looked both ways, see if anybody's looking, you know. <laughs> you know how we are, right? You know how we are. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get off of our property. And a little later that day, the staff came in. I, I dragged them all out to the parking lot. Everybody lay your hands on these. God told us to get rid of these walls. Lay your hands on them. Command them to be gone in Jesus' name. Oh, all the staff's out there. You know, in the name of Jesus, you know, and we prayed over those walls. That was on a Tuesday morning, Saturday night at service. We did the service. I did the service, finished preaching, dismissed everybody. And I'm standing up at the front in the West Auditorium over there. And this man that I noticed sitting in the back, I didn't know who he was, but I noticed him sitting in the back. He came up after the service and he, he waited to talk to me. And he said, hey, uh, you know, introduced himself. And he said, hey, do you want to get those walls out? I said, yes, I do. He said, I'll get them out for you. I said, okay. Uh, I said, okay, thank you. I said, well, now, what do you mean? Uh, like, how will you get them out? He said, well, he said, I I'm not from Southern California. I live in Washington State. But I'm just down here in Southern California on a construction job with my company. And he said, uh, and w we have the wherewithal to be able to remove those walls. So I'll get them out for you. Well, I got a little experience now as pastor. So, you know, I, I asked him, um, now, are you saying that you'll get them out for free? <laughs> How many of you know you need to clarify these days, right? Because a bill will show up in the mail. And so uh, he said, uh, no, it won't be free, but it won't cost you a penny. He said, I'll come by with my boss Tuesday and we'll look it over. They showed up. They looked it over. And they said, okay, yeah, we'll come at such and such time. Within two weeks, those walls were gone. It didn't cost us a penny. It didn't cost us a penny. When, within two weeks, within two weeks, stop waiting on money and use your faith. 
if you say it without doubting, you'll not only do what was done to this fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, it will obey you. See, God is speaking to us and he's telling us, I have called you to move mountains. But until you hear my voice, until you put yourself under the word of God, so that you can hear the voice of God, you will not have the faith to stand up to that mountain. You can talk like it, look like it, but that mountain knows you ain't got it. You ain't got it. But when you have it, oh, let me tell you, the mountain will begin to shake. That situation will move because God's power is real. God's power is real. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is powerful. Praise God. He's speaking today. He's speaking today. God is speaking to you today. God is speaking to you today. Anybody in here, you think you're hearing from God. God is saying, no, you're hearing me. I'm telling you, you are not called to be like everybody else. You are not like everybody else. You are not subject to the same limitations as everybody else. I have called you to walk in the supernatural, says God. And you must hear me and begin to walk at the level on which I've called you, says the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Let's stand right now, can we? Oh, we need to, we need to do something right now. Glory to God. We need to do something right now. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Praise God. Stretch your hands up to the Lord. Say to Father God, oh, I'm hearing you, Father. Come on, say it out loud. I know you're speaking to me. I'm not only hearing your word, I'm hearing your voice. I believe you, Lord, and I want to believe you. I want to walk on water however you want me to. I want to move the mountains the way you want me to. I want to pray the way you want me to. But Lord, I just need to know what you're saying to me. So I'm looking to you, Lord. I'm setting my attention on you. Lord, I choose to be one who sings songs. <laughs> Let me just tell you right now. Boy, at, at night, I've had the habit. You can put your hands down for a minute. I've had the habit at night of liking to just go through. I got a certain app that has some news, and I just like to go through news just to keep abreast as to what's happening out there because I don't have a lot of time to watch all of that. But I just like to, I can read through a lot faster than trying to watch a lot of things on, on television or something. However, <laughs> this Isaiah 30 passage, the Lord's saying, you want me to speak, right? And just before you go to bed, you fill your mind with all that stuff that includes so much of what Donald Trump say and what they say about what Donald Trump said. And are they going to impeach him? Did he really do something wrong? What's this guy doing? That guy's saying that. Blah, 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 blah. There's so much of that just in news. Isn't that right? And, 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 and I'm not saying that political things are, aren't important. They are important. They are important. However, you can get caught up in the soap drama. Is that right? And you're just watching this thing play out as if it's a week-to-week -week soap drama and such and not hear God. And you're missing out on your, the, the drama that's supposed to be happening in your life, the good drama. Because we don't hear the Lord. And so I've begun to just sing a little song at night, getting in bed, anything. Oh, I will bless the Lord. I'll bless the Lord at all times. Thank you, Lord. And turn the attention and say, Lord, because I want to hear from you. At some point, we have to listen if we want to hear. At some point, we got to block out everything and say, Lord, I need to hear from you, so I'm setting my attention on you. Let's do that right now, can we? I know some people are not accustomed to this, but you, if you want to walk in the supernatural, you're going to have to learn to do this. Come on, let's stretch a hand up to the Lord right now. Well, I trust that you heard the Lord speak to you. Isn't it amazing how God can speak to us in any way, at any time, and knows just what to say? 
Hey, for more resources, for more information, you can always go to jerrydearman.com. And when you do, don't forget to subscribe to our brand new Solid Lives magazine. This is filled with articles that will strengthen you and events to build your faith. And so we just want to get to you as much as possible to be able to help you to be the person that God has called you to be. God bless you and have a great day.